I want you to understand what it means as a leader uh, to be on kind of a, the big data journey. Because for all of us who are leaders for the rest of our careers now, uh, data, specifically moving data to information and knowledge to wisdom, uh, is going to be a huge part of being a leader. And so it's important to understand what does that journey look like. The more data that you have, the more concisely you're able to, to see the truth, right? as long as you don't slip over into data obesity. So, so big data is a philosophy. Now, let's talk about why has it gotten a name and why did it explode? All right, there's a few things that happened all at once uh, you know, over the course of just a short course of a few years, right? And, and these are the kinds of things that happen. Uh, we started to get all kinds of new data sources, sources we didn't have before, and that, that you know, made the volume of data go up tremendously. Uh, we also got a, a much uh, less expensive ability to store data, and so that helped quite a bit, right? And you've seen all the statistics. I don't need to go over with you, uh, you know, what a megabyte used to cost versus what a megabyte costs today. It's tremendous. We also got a lot of new software platforms that helped us to be able to manage the data. So in other words, Google couldn't do what Google does today without the Hadoop platform, right? With, without the software that they got to be able to run in their data centers, they could not index what they have to index today. So we got new tools. So then we added some other things. We started learning how to clean up the data in a lot better ways. And so we got a lot of data quality tools. That was helpful. You know, then we added on new abilities to access the information. And so that made it a lot simpler for us to actually be able to, to get the visibility that we wanted to get. Then we added the human element. We started to add people who had uh, much more of an ability to do the data analysis, to be creative and innovative with what they saw inside the data. And so really over the course of three to five years, you know, all of these things kind of came together. And then you got this name for big data. Right, this concept that, wow, we can aggregate huge amounts of data. And if we can do that, we can see things we've never seen before, then we can make better decisions than we've ever made before. For a long time, we have talked about this thing called the DIKW chain. Uh, and the whole concept here is that every step is more valuable than the last. Uh, so you start out with data, right? You have raw data, it's a raw material. Uh, this is just graphically a healthcare example, right? Uh, and then you move from data to information. And all that means is we have collated the data into a way where we can now at least extrapolate something out of it, right? It's not raw. We put it into a report format. We've sorted it. We can at least look at it and get some information out of it that's valuable to us. Data and information are typically on the IT side of the fence. It's typically the, the IT people who have to deal with those two, that, that level of getting raw data into some format, right? A report, a dashboard, something that you can consume. Then it switches over to knowledge. OK, now it's all you. And it's all you. Right? The IT department now is out of this. Now it's user controlled. Right? So now you've got knowledge. What knowledge means is you've now taken the information off of a, a, a screen, and you've put it into your brain. And it is now permanently there as some form of knowledge. You own it now. You can now use it to be creative and innovative. You can now use it to solve problems, because you've taken it off the devices and you put it here. Next step is wisdom, or in our case, making wise decisions. So instead of making instinctual decisions, which could be wrong, right? we're making fact-based decisions. So we're making wise decisions. Again, that's all you. Now what you've done is you've taken this knowledge that's in your brain, and you have turned it into something that is of value, which is a wise decision. Now, I could stop here on this slide. And I know you're going to think I'm exaggerating, but I could talk to you for another hour now about just the interesting things going on in this DIKW chain in the world. I will give you just one of them, just to give you an example why this kind of thing is important to understand. Uh, let's talk about kids. Uh, I, I'm writing a book right now. The book is called Did God Invent the Internet? And the book is all about, is technology going to help or hurt the human race? And one of the chapters is just on information, right? immersive amounts of information and how it's changing us. Now, I've been studying this for years. Here's an interesting thing, right? I will talk about a loop, right? This, there's a loop between information and knowledge. It is possible for you to get information but not have knowledge. So you think about when we were kids, uh, we were taught in the memorization and regurgitation me method, right? 
They would make us memorize all kinds of things, regurgitate it on a test, and if you had a good memory, you got an A. It didn't mean you were smart, by the way. It meant you had a good memory. It also didn't mean that it was knowledge, did it? Because for a lot of this, we would memorize it, spit it out on a report, and forget it all within a day. It wasn't knowledge. It was information that just passed through our brains. You get you with me on this? You have to say yes. Thank you. If I ask and you just stare at me, I, I don't know if you're with me. All right, so if you understand that, what do you think is happening today with young people who can look up every single fact in an instant on a device? What's happening is they're getting stuck in an information chasm where they have massive access to information, but they're not translating it into knowledge because they don't have to. Because they can get any piece of information they want from the device in an instant. They don't need to put it here. So you know what happens? Uh, my son, he repaired his car not too long ago. He's not a big um, repair kind of kid, right? But he, uh, he actually used the internet to tear the dash off of his car and replace a bunch of uh, lights in it and put the dash back on. I was massively impressed. And then I realized he used his iPad and a Chilton's manual to do it all. Now, he has no concept of how to repair cars. Couldn't repair the next car has no idea how he could do anything else, but he could follow directions right on that iPad. And so that was the way he was able to do what he did. Now, translate that to when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I had to tear apart the engine, a V8 engine on an old Impala. And I tore the engine down while somebody stood next to me and helped me do it. Right? It was experiential learning. And by the time I had torn that down and put that back together again, I knew a lot about engines. And I could work on a lot of different cars, but not my son. He can follow instructions on an iPad. This is why understanding DIKW is important, is because in the workplace, with our kids, it is best if we can move data to information, to usable knowledge that is in your brain, to wise decisions. Because it is absolutely possible to have a gap between information and knowledge, which is, I can get on the internet and get information like this anytime. It's just not here. And you might say, well, what does that matter, Scott? If it's right on my device at a moment's notice, do I need to have it here? You do. If you want to be creative, if you want to be innovative, if you want to be a good problem solver, then there's a certain amount of information you need to have here. Because it is the, it is the groundwork that helps you make good decisions.